Hello everyone, welcome back. So, uh, in this lecture, we'll continue from where we left off in the last uh, lecture. So, uh, we introduced the concept of spatial frequencies and how a certain medium may or may not allow them to propagate. And it turns out that this is a more fundamental, uh, the idea of spatial frequencies is a more fundamental way of looking at a diffraction limit. So, you might be familiar with the diffraction limit which was introduced by Abbe back in 1873. What he said was, if you have two, uh, let's say, dots or two objects which are very, very close to each other, then, I mean, the observation is that we cannot resolve them clearly. Okay. So what he said was, he quantified it and he said, if I have two objects, let's, let's say P1 and P2, and if the distance delta between them is less than this number, okay, delta is less than lambda by 2. Okay, basically this Na is numerical aperture, numerical aperture and lambda is a wavelength. So uh, let me say lambda is let's say 532 nanometers. Okay, I'm trying to see two closely spaced objects with a wavelength of light, uh, let's say uh, 532 nanometers. So if those objects are less than roughly lambda by 2, okay, because for now I can say that Na is equal to 1, just assume that it doesn't really matter. Okay, so if the objects are less than lambda by two, we cannot clearly resolve them. Okay, uh, that is an observation that Abbe made, and he quantified it in terms of lambda. But how do we understand that? The way to understand it is: let's say I'm trying to image um, a, a point, let's say P1, using a lens. A lens could be simply your pupil, right? Your eye. It images on the retina. So what happens is when your object is like this it essentially forms a diffraction pattern okay inside you know it diffracts through the the iris and you know the lenses in your uh, sorry the iris in your uh, eye and then you form a diffraction pattern okay so if your object is very large there's no problem you will see it clearly but the the moment the object let's say the p1 the size of p1 becomes less than lambda then what happens is it, it, it becomes more and more, uh, it diffracts more and more, okay? And because of that, the diffraction pattern spreads. Essentially, the diffraction is a, uh, is a kind of a Fourier transform of the object, okay? So now, you have two such objects, let's say, P1 and P2. Both of those are going to diffract, and this is the characteristic, you know, feature, the airy disk is what we call them. If you have a, if a circular object, then you have an airy disk. And essentially, you have these two diffraction patterns that are formed. The, uh, and when you try to image, the, I mean, sorry, uh, when you try to image, or rather when you try to see it, you'll see that the overall image is going to be some of this, okay? Some of these two, and you'll you'll see, uh, if uh, they're far apart, you'll see clearly as two objects, but if they're very, very close to each other, less than the lambda, then you will not see the overall uh, shape of the object, but you see one broad envelope, okay? Instead of seeing two distinct objects like this, you might see something like this. Okay, so this is basically not resolved. And if you see two barely there, just resolved. And this is fully resolved. Okay. So what uh, we understand by the idea of diffraction limit is that you can, uh, if you if your uh, distance between the objects is smaller than the wavelength of light or less than uh, wave lambda by two, then it's very difficult to see them with an ordinary microscope. So what? Why is why does that happen? Well, our analysis of spatial frequencies gives us a hint. So what happens is space itself, like let's say you're looking at an object far away from your eye, right? The air itself, the, the free space, acts as a low pass filter. Okay, space acts as low pass filter. So what's happening is, when your object is very uh, large, okay, if uh, object is large, kx, ky are small, so kz is real, right? But when your object is small, this kx, ky are large, and kz becomes imaginary. What happens when Kz is imaginary? 
Well, we saw that as Z increases, the information is lost. So those higher spatial frequencies are lost, and because of that, you are not clearly seeing the information. All right. So this is a diffraction limit that you know it's very simple. It's just one small step ahead of what we did last time. Okay. Now, so what? Well, is it a fundamental limit? Well, it's a <laughs> it's a fundamental limit. Maybe when we didn't understand what was happening. But the moment scientists realize what was happening, there are ways to actually overcome this. Okay, and this is what uh, basically what we can do is the problem is that the higher spatial frequencies are getting lost. So how to overcome that? Well, take those higher frequencies and convert them into propagating waves. So we said the higher spatial frequencies are evanescent; they're decaying with uh, Z, right? Instead of before they decay, capture it and then convert it into propagating waves, and that way you can actually retrieve the information that is there even in the uh, close to the object okay so in this context uh, we define uh, rather we we define a uh, two terms near field and far field okay when you are looking at let's say you have an object let's say i have an object of this fashion and i'm looking at distances less than lambda okay distances less than lambda roughly lambda i call this as near field and if i'm looking at f any distance above that i'll call it as far field okay so when i'm in the near field my information is still present so if you go very very close to the object you can still see it the evanescent waves have a decent amount of amplitude and you can probably see it but how do we go so close can i bring a let's say i'm trying to look at a small uh, small ball nanosphere can i bring it to you know let's say less than lambda like can i bring it to 200 nanometers from i no it's not going to be possible right so that's why what we can do is there are multiple techniques to overcome that okay one of them is what is known as uh, Uh, scattering near field optical microscope snom so what we do in this case is we take an optical fiber tip okay optical fiber and you taper it into this fashion and bring it very well let's say this is my object that i want to see okay if i look at it in the far field with a lens common microscope i won't see it so what i can do is i can take an optical microscope and bring it very close to it and then convert these evanescent waves so there are these waves that are going to decay here right as i propagate if i do this there are waves which are fast decaying okay this is my this is my evanescent wave when i have my evanescent wave the information is lost but before it is lost let me put a fiber tip and capture some of it and once it goes into a fiber it can propagate for very long distance of course because the fiber has a higher refractive index as well right so it can support those but it cannot do infinite i mean you cannot let's say spatial frequency is twice the fundamental or something or rather twice the k not or three times k not we cannot okay up to about certain limit 1.5 times k not can be captured using a optical fiber okay so i'll capture that and i'll look at it i'll go very very close to it okay that's one way this is called snom and then there are of course couple of other ways where you know what uh, the second one is what is known as localization microscopy let's say if i have objects which are like spaced apart more than lambda i can still do some tricks in the far field to try to resolve it to less than you know nanometers uh, tens of nanometers kind of a resolution okay much below the diffraction limit but it, we can play some tricks okay I think there was a Nobel Prize for this in 2014 or so. And uh, the the third alternative is to actually convert this near field into far field. So by using, let's say, I can use. I mean, we'll talk about this in the third week, wherein I'll use, let's say, uh, some plasmonic structures, which are very, very. I mean, plasmonic antennas, which effectively take this information, which is localized in this small area, and then it can be propagated into far field. Okay. So there are multiple ways of doing these things. and so as i said if you understand the phenomena deeply you can invent ways to circumvent that okay and lot of interesting work is going on in this direction you might say okay all this is theoretical so what <laughs> okay it's beautiful but so what well one of the examples i can give you of what we just understood in the last one hour is uh, application in lithography okay if you look at all the cmos uh, devices right now one of the critical steps in those uh, in the fabrication of those devices is what is known as lithography okay uh, it comes from a greek word and so on what happens is let's say you you want to print an object okay so on the left i see an image of what is uh, what are known as uh, finfets fabricated by intel using what is known as 22 nanometer technology essentially what you see here are transistors okay which are very very small you know the, the node is called 22 nanometers the sizes might be up to 30 to 40 nanometers in size okay so you have this small uh, beams of silicon which are there okay this is my silicon what are known as fins and this is my gate so i have devices which are very very small in this fashion 
and I have to fabricate them. And one of the most critical things in the fabrication is what is known as lithography. And briefly, what lithography means is that let's say I have some objects on the on a, on a screen. You know, it's similar to what is you know what used to happen in the cameras in the olden days. So let's say you have an object, you image it on a lens, and then you uh, you you develop it. Okay, that's what lithography does. So now you have an optical system which is capturing, let's say, some image here. But now we are saying that these distances are very very small. D is much much smaller than lambda. Lambda in this case, in the current uh, commercial technologies, right? In the majority of the commercial technologies, the lambda is 193 nanometers. This is a uh, excimer laser. Okay. Now, how are we able to print? What happens is when you are using lambda, which is 193 nanometers, and then we are uh, fabricating devices which are much much smaller than the wavelength. Okay. The reason this is achieved is, I mean, the semiconductor industry does a lot of tricks, and uh, some of those are actually captured in this slide here. So we already saw uh, what is known as a, a diffraction limit, right? And something similar, there's a resolution pat, uh, factor, which essentially is given in lithography by this. You know, you have the lambda and the numerical aperture, and there's a process uh, parameter, empirical parameter. Okay, so now. If I try to image, let's say some structure, okay. If I want to fabricate a device like this, I need to fabricate it on what is known as a mask. Then this mask will be printed. So this is my mask. So I'll shine some light on that mask and then print that image on the in the, in the on the wafer semiconductor. This is my wafer. So then I can move my wafer, print again, print again, and so on. So that's how the lithography happens. Okay. So when I have, uh, when I want to print these things. What you quickly see is that uh, these are some simulations of how the image of Samsung looks like. In the previous case, we showed how Nano looks like, right? Now we are trying to show what happens when you have various, uh, let's say, image of uh, Samsung using various technologies. So, uh, in the first case, this if you have a lambda of let's say 248 nanometers, and I try to print it, you know, with some uh, a system, you'll see that it's not very clearly resolved in this case. Okay. But if I want to clearly resolve, I can't. I have to go to what is known as argon fluoride, which is 193 nanometers. Okay, so this is 193 nanometers. Okay, so yeah, you see the wavelength. If I try to image it with 248 nanometers, I don't see it clearly. But of course, I should go to smaller wavelength. So I go to 193 nanometers, and I can do some tricks and I can improve the resolution, Samsung. Okay, but the way to improve improve it even further is by what is known as immersion lithography okay in this case this is immersion what we do is uh, just the question that was asked right lithography if we change the index surrounding the uh, uh, the wafer i can actually capture higher spatial frequencies right so instead of using uh, air if i use water water has a refractive index of 1.33 and so I can get a better image. Okay, so if you compare this, I mean there are okay. Let's not worry about the NA improvements. NA improvements are done by modifying the system. But if you go from argon fluoride, which is 193, and same argon fluoride but now immersion, you see the big difference. How the image is better. Okay, so the idea is simple, but how semiconductor industry managed to do this is a is an interesting story in itself, right? And so people have been improving these structures, but fundamentally there is a limit. Okay, and uh, you might ask, okay, why don't we reduce the lambda further, further smaller than that? Why don't you use, let's say, 157? Okay, it turned out that even 157 they have tried in the semiconductor industry, but the source is not very stable and uh, it never really took off because it also is important that these lithography machines have to run 24 by 7. So it turned out, turned out that the the reliability of that is not very high. So industry even now is stuck. Majority of the production happens with 193 nanometers and they are doing amazing amount of uh, resolution enhancement to actually get to a place where we can look at um, small features all right but now with the advent of let's say 10 nanometer technology and so on right now where, where the current uh, microprocessor production is 10 and 7 nanometers uh, it is becoming impossible to actually just do with 193 nanometers so to circumvent that the industry invented what is known as extreme uv lithography wherein these are all excimer lasers. There's a certain limitation to how much they can improve beyond that. So what they do is uh, this extreme UV wavelength of 1, uh, 13.5 nanometers. Once you have a uh, wavelength which is very, very small like this, you can in principle 
get much better resolution. So you see the same thing here. If I use extreme UV lithography, I'm able to get very, very clear image. So this is a simulation done just to show you the impact of various parameters. All right. And we see that understanding diffraction limit and understanding how waves propagate has actually technological implications. We don't see it on a day to day basis, but definitely the, the, the improvements are undeniable. All right. And so there are many interesting questions, you know, how one uh, 13.5 nanometers is essentially X-ray, close to X-ray. So how do you, you know, make lenses for it? How do you make uh, mirrors for it and so on? They're very difficult. You will see in, at the end of second or third week, that second week rather, that, uh, yeah, when you have very small wavelength, the energy is going to be large. And so not, I mean, uh, not every material can be used for that. So we have to design structures okay so that is also you could call it nanophotonics because the structures that we will design are thin films consisting of various metals and so on uh, we will probably give it as an exercise and leave it for you but yeah so this has some very practical implications all right so yeah th that was about diffraction limit that i wanted to discuss let me just uh, take a uh, short break and then i'll come back to uh, how electromagnetic waves are generated Thank you so much.